Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. Now, they are founding members of the European Union and they see themselves as front runners in European integration. Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands pioneered a customs union 80 years ago, which showed their neighbours the benefits of trading without tariffs. The three countries were also among the original members of the European Economic Community, created in 1957. Well, Benelux prime ministers hold quite regular summits, and there are numerous ministerial and parliamentary contacts between the three. But while these three countries have given impetus to key EU files, their record on tax and financial matters has been seen as somewhat mixed. For this debate in our series about groups of countries, I'm joined by three MEPs. Firstly, Isabel Wiesler-Lima, an MEP from Luxembourg and a member of the European People's Party. Welcome to you. Good morning. Joined also by Sophie Innertfeld, a Dutch MEP from Renew Europe. Welcome back to the programme. And also pleased to welcome Philip Lamberts, a Belgian MEP from the Group of the Greens, also a regular on France 24. Welcome back to you as well. Um, uh, Sophie, it felt so just a general point about uh, Benelux cooperation. Have you felt much kind of tangible benefits from this in your political career, would you say? I, I think, look, the, the Benelux as an organization, I haven't had a lot of uh, dealings with, I have to say. But of course, I mean, countries which have a shared history, which know, you know, they know each other's culture, although there are big differences, much bigger than people think. Um, but three smaller countries that have a history of cooperation. Yeah, I mean, you, you find each other easily, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Philip Lambert, so on, on the question of uh, tax um, avoidance, to put it, yep. uh, to put it uh, bluntly, we know that uh, before the 2022 Benelux agreement, uh, the three countries were losing billions of euros because of the way value-added tax was not being collected and the differences in the, the, the rules for collecting it between the three countries. Do you think that's changed now? Has, have things improved? Well, I don't know on the VAT front, but certainly uh, these three countries share uh, a habit of uh, trying to, uh, to lure multinationals in setting up shop well, actually not shop, but offices uh, in their countries in order uh, to, to benefit from their presence and stealing uh, tax revenue away from other member states. That, that is a tradition that all three countries have pursued, not something that we Greens have uh, advocated, but the reality is there. And indeed... Uh, Sorry, when you say setting up shop, you're talking about shell companies, these so-called screen companies? or Well, uh, corporate <laughs> holdings, uh, where mm. basically you shift yeah. uh, profits in order to tax them as little as possible. Well, yeah. we are not alone in this. I mean, Ireland, Cyprus uh, sure, played that game too. Yeah. But this is a game uh, that is detrimental to the well-being of Europeans yeah. as a yeah. whole. And there's, of course, a scandal in France now with the French dairy company, Lactalis, yeah, Lactalis. which is accused of... Uh, pushing its uh, its uh, operations uh, to subsidiaries uh, in Belgium and Luxembourg. So is, would that be an example of this uh, as absolutely. well? Absolutely, and that shows you yeah. that it has not ended. I mean, we are yeah. still pretty much in a situation where there's, uh, there's competition between uh, European member states to, uh, to attract these multinationals. Isabel Wiesler, so just a point about the situation in Luxembourg. So mm -hmm. there was this uh, famous investigation called uh, Open, Open Lux. Lux in 2021 mm -hmm. by Le Monde and other newspapers. Uh, and uh, the, the results of that showed that uh, I think they said 45% of companies set up in Luxembourg were so-called shell companies. Again, what steps have been taken since then in Luxembourg? Uh, the, the, the journalist of Le Monde that was interviewed by, um, by France 24 said that um, we are very transparent. It's because it's transparency that this, um, that this inquiry could be made. And I, I really refuse the idea of opacity of the Luxembourg financial system. That's not the case. We have made um, really efforts that, uh, that there is transparency. We are the ones that are most of the time the first ones to transpose every directives of, uh, of the European Union. We are 
on the really top on the cooperation. We make the exchange of the of the um, of the information with the other countries, European countries, but also outside the, the, the European Union. We are not opposed on on uh, also this um, this taxation, this uh, um, worldwide taxation. We we really push forward to more transparency and to to have as as much as possible transparency but again this is uh, this is this is an international matter and uh, a worldwide matter and sophie and it felt in in terms of uh, of the netherlands as a country for shifting as a transit country for corporate profits which is something that the global uh, tax uh, justice uh, advocacy group highlighted do you have any thoughts on on that issue well, I think more generally that we should all yeah. agree that uh, you know, everybody has to pay their fair share yeah. because you pay into the national budget and then the national budget is used for you know, the, 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 the public interest. Uh, and I think the, 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 those who have the most money pay uh, the fewest taxes and the other way around. Now, we have introduced, uh, I don't know when exactly it will start, I think it already kicked in, the 15% the uh, 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 corporate taxation worldwide, which is the first step. But if you compare that already, 15%. To can you show me anyone, a normal a factory worker that pays only 15% that doesn't exist? And it was one case which I thought illustrated perfectly how, how ridiculous this is. You mentioned Ireland. There was the case of uh, Apple, which got a, a very favorable uh, uh, tax deal, which meant that it um, it didn't have to pay 13 billion euros in, in taxes and then the European Commission had to take the Irish government to court in order for it to collect 13 billion in taxes. Mm. I mean, but those, that 13 billion is money which is being spent on hospitals, on public transports, on schools, on... So it's like, you know, the rich stealing from the, from the poor. Now, I'm, I, I understand that, that, that businesses want to, to you know, they're in, in any possible way, they're going to try and find the best place to, to set up shop. But uh, it cannot be that you're competing with tax rates, which are, you know, sometimes below 1%. Mm. Now, I'd like us to take a look at salaries in the Benelux countries and then get some thoughts from uh, my guests. So, in the Netherlands, the median salary is 2,500 euros a month. In Belgium, it's a bit lower than that, 2,300 euros. And then the highest of the three, and actually the highest in the European Union, is Luxembourg with a median salary of 3,800 euros a month. Uh, Philippe Lamberts, if we take those first two median salaries, it's actually not much when you consider the cost of living crisis. And do you think that the new budget rules that the EU has just agreed, is that going to put even more pressure on wages? Absolutely, because uh, uh, these rules that have, and I insist on that, zero foundation in economic science, or I would say in political common sense, uh, will indeed cause massive, uh, uh, I would say, Deficits in investments, and we need investments to secure our future economic well-being, mm. facing the climate crisis, but also facing the competition from China, from the US, etc. They are spending like hell, and we would say, guys, we can't afford to invest in our future. And indeed, if then you absolutely want to invest, it's going to be to the detriment of, some, of something else, and that may be ordinary expenditures, but you know where this goes. It goes to public services, to social security, uh, uh, that will hit, by definition, the weakest in society. So if you really want to turn the public opinions of all three countries that are basically favorable to the European Union against the European Union, yeah. just do that. I think that we have to, to take care how the money is spent. I'm absolutely, I absolutely agree on the fact that the money is needed for the, the investments. For, and investments that are good structural for, for the countries. And I also, I, I, I really want to highlight the fact that we still have this next generation EU that has been a, a, um, a really asset from the, from the European Union where we all together had raised money that is, that is there for the countries and it is still there for the, for the countries to make these structural investments yeah. and, on, and on things that are necessary for the next generations. It's about, um, it's about uh, the climate, it's about uh, digitalization, and these are 
the, the investments that have to be done because this, this debt that we have has to be paid back by the next generations. So, so this, is, this is absolutely crucial. Just a, a final point on that, uh, Sophie Nettfeld, but what, what about these new EU budget rules? Um, you think they're going to impact wages and key investments? Well, look, it's all a choice for the national governments. Uh, and I, I slightly, I mean, I agree with the principles, but I slightly disagree uh, if you say that this is now, uh, you know, ushering in a new era of austerity. In Belgium, uh, you know, the, the national expenditure is about 53% of the GDP. It's the second highest in, uh, in Europe. So you cannot tell me that there is no room in that 53%, which is also public money paid for by, yeah. by taxpayers, mm -hmm. that there is no room for more efficiency and, and maybe shifting, uh, shifting priorities around. And of course you can invest, but uh, if, you're, if you're just, you know, if, there, if you invest, then you also get a return on investment. If you're just building more and more and more uh, debts, then basically you're, you're leaving that as a legacy to future for, for generations. Generation. Let's not forget that in recent, in recent years, we've had a, uh, fortunately, uh, a very brief spike in interest rates. So suddenly that means that the debts that you have to service, mm -hmm. you know, cost you money. And that money is paid for by the citizens. So I, I think I, I agree with the need to, to invest and to spend the money uh, wisely. But I also think that a bit more efficiency and less waste yep. uh, would be a good thing. Let's end it on that. And thank you so much to my three guests, Philippe Lambert, Isabel Wiesler-Lima and Sophie Innetfeld. Glad you could join us for this discussion.